number one algae eater, number one detritivore, number one invert in my book. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to our channel. We're here today at the Orlando Superstore. We're trying to get this video in before we open for business for the day. So there's a lot going on. We've got the 4,000 gallon tanks being worked on. There's drywall going up, all sorts of stuff happening behind the scenes. So it's pretty busy. So I'm gonna try to work around some of the noise and the hustle and bustle. But today, we wanna talk about why our tanks look so good. So one of the main questions when people come to our store is why are our tanks always so clean? And I'm assuming that's because the vast majority of the people that ask that question don't have such a pristine looking reef. And today we're here to talk about one of the main reasons that I think our tanks look so good, aside from the fact that the, the team puts in all the work. You know, I can't take away from that. They put in a lot of time and effort and care and devotion, but we have a lot of things that happen on a regular that lead to a clean tank. And part of that is gonna be inverts. So for anyone who does get a chance to make it to our Orlando store or even our Winter Park store for that matter, we have a section here that's specifically for inverts and it never looks very good. It's always kind of like a hodgepodge of different things, but you can't really organize inverts and make them look good like we can corals, but they're here to serve a purpose. Um, and you'll see different things like blood shrimp and feather dusters and bumblebee snails and a ton of hermit crabs. We even keep separate containers here that have pistol shrimp, pistol shrimp pears, maybe pistol shrimp pears with a paired goby, um, emerald crabs, peppermint shrimp. There's a lot of different inverts and you know, it, as time goes on and you start to determine what needs that you have for your aquarium, you're going to find that you're going to pick one out here and one out there that will serve a specific purpose. So I've got a little container here. I've asked Alex to throw together for me and it's a whole bunch of different inverts that you're going to regularly see on our site or here in our retail store. And I kind of want to start first with the algae eaters. How do we take care of the algae and what types of algae are there? We have the really dusty algae that shows up on the glass that I believe we call diatoms. Whether it is or not, I really don't know. Again, I'm not a scientist, but it grows on the inside of the glass after a day or two of not cleaning it. And you're gonna see these here. These are Astrea snails. Sometimes they're being called turbo snails. And you can always tell they have a pearl-like operculum. And obviously this conical shape shell these to me are the workhorse of the aquarium i think they knew they do more on a regular for the tank than any other snail there's a downside to them if they land like this chances are that peppermint shrimp or a fish or anything that's going to be an opportunistic feeder is going to take it and pick it apart and it can't flip itself over so as great as they are, they do come with flaws. This is a margarita snail. Um, there's pink ones, but these are what they call black margaritas. They always have this really shiny crown on top of their, their blunt conical shaped shell. This, this margarita snail, this also has an operculum just like the Astrea snail, but you can see that it's a very thin gold colored trapdoor. Um, these guys hold on a little bit better so in terms of being long lived, these will outlive the Astrea snail. However, they eat different types of algae and you'll find these more on the rocks or on a frag rack if you have a frag rack than the Astrea as well. This is a crowd favorite. This is a banded trochus snail. You can see how active they are. They don't seem to be bothered by any happenings around them. So they're not afraid to stick that foot out and flip themselves over, which is the one main Part of why this snail is such a popular snail, if we let it sit there long enough, he'll reach out and he'll kind of wiggle his foot back and forth enough to get himself righted, which is a super big benefit to that snail. However, the downside is they don't eat nearly as much algae as say a margarita or an astrea snail will. I'm sure that's better than it was back there. Okay. All right, so we had to move. It was getting really loud back there. They're starting to sand the drywall above and below the, the 4,000 gallon tanks. And that made it really super hard to talk over. So um, 
and I left off on the Trochus nail. The one downside to the Trochus nail is they're expensive. I want to say they, they sell anywhere between four and six bucks a piece, depending on the freight cost, depending on where you're shopping. Um, they're expensive, but they don't nearly die. Probably half of what an Astria does. Another algae eater that is by far the biggest workhorse in the aquarium is the Mexican Turbo Snail. They die really easy. Same thing as Astria. If they do turn upside down, your best bet is to just get them upright again on the rocks. They're gonna be doing a lot of work on the rocks and they're gonna be doing a lot of work on any solid surface. They don't walk across sand very well. Um, when it comes to filamentous algae, I don't know that there's a better snail. You could put in, you know, we've done it many times in the past. If you've got a section like this big here in your aquarium, if you dropped five Mexican turbo snails on that rock structure, by morning you would see an, a significant improvement in how much algae is on the rock. So awesome, awesome, awesome snail. But again, they come with that baggage. They do not flip themselves over and you have to replace them. Another really good algae eater, the Mythrax crab or uh, emerald crabs. These are a little feisty, but they are really good at taking care of bubble algae. So I guess I probably could have used more of them in my aquarium, huh? The emerald crab, keep in mind, it's a really good crab for keeping bubble algae at bay. So there's a couple of things you can do. You can go through and pop the bubbles, which even if that does cause it to spread, it's popped. And the, the point to be made there is that emerald crab will eat it when it's not engorged with water. They will not eat them when they're big and, and bulbous. Or if they do, they're not gonna eat nearly as many. So mark my words, if you're having problems with bubble algae and you go through and you pop all the bubbles and throw emerald crabs in there, they're gonna immediately start picking at those filaments, which they can't really when they're bulbous. They're primarily herbivorous but they will eat waste, so they're opportunistic as well. Another one, and I've seen these called a nuisance snail before. They're not, not at all. These are like little miniature abalone. They are called stomatella snails, and you can see they've got a shell only on the backside. It's actually a really fast moving snail. A lot of times if you mount a new frag, you'll see them on the bottom side of the frag. But this, this is a, it's a widespread, naturally occurring snail in your aquarium. If you see them, don't take them out. They're awesome. This is a pincushion urchin. There's a, a few different types of urchins out there that are really good for the aquarium. If you're doing some sort of remediation and you have a lot of filamentous algae growing, these guys are probably gonna be your savior. Here's the trick, they get big, you know, when they're full grown, they can barely fit inside of this cup here. So they do get big, they get big relatively quickly. And I'm sure if I leave him in here long enough, he's gonna pick up every invert that can't fend for itself and put it on its back. They've got these little tubular shaped tentacles on them. That's what they'll hold on to the hermit crab shells with. Or you can even stick them to the glass and hold them there just long enough and they'll hold on to the glass and that's how they do it. So there's a couple different types of hermit crabs. These are blue legs. If I was to pick my favorite invert for keeping my aquarium in good condition, it's gonna be the blue legs. And one of the tricks that I use is, this is about as big as I like to see them. When they're small like this, they're the best. They get into all the tight little nooks and crannies. Because we're talking about algae eaters, these guys are the best algae eater, but the best part about them is not that they eat algae, it's that they eat everything. So if there's waste on the bottom of the aquarium from excess food or, or fish waste or whatever it may be, these guys are awesome detritivores. You'll see them on the sand bed, you'll see them on the rocks, you'll see them hanging on the, the silicone corners of your glass. They literally get everywhere. And because they don't care what they're eating, they benefit you that much more because you don't have to have them there to fix a problem. They're there to do everything right forever. When they get big, they'll take over a shell that's this size and they're not as mobile. They don't get around in between your Acropora branches. They don't get in the nooks and crannies of the rock to get all that detritus that settles. So I actually get rid of them when they're that big and put them in a monster aquarium 
and then I go back to a whole bunch of tiny ones. And then as they progress, we kind of go through that cycle. But number one algae eater, number one detritivore, number one invert in my book. There's also red leg hermit crabs, which are very, very similar in stature to the blue leg. The difference is obviously they've got red colored legs. They're a little bit more aggressive. You're gonna find that they're gonna do the same type of work as a blue leg will, but they will end up eating your snails more frequently than a blue leg will. So they're just, a, they're, they're an aggressive eater is that is pretty much all it is. But the bottom line, Anybody who keeps a reef tank knows that there's always an opportunity that if you've got, uh, like let's use a copper band butterfly as an example. A copper band will eat Aptasia, but they also stand the chance of eating your coral, okay? Peppermint shrimp, another one, they eat Aptasia, but they also stand the chance of eating your coral. So because all these animals, they coexist in the same space, you have to expect that if you don't feed enough, if there's not enough readily available food for these animals, they're gonna find another alternative. Let's talk about other detritivores. This is a good one. Another one of my favorites is a tiger conch. These guys are awesome, but they don't get around the best. So you're gonna find them in a sandy or some sort of substrate bottom, and that's all they're gonna do. They're only gonna move around in the bottom of the the aquarium. That's not a negative in any way, shape, or form. You've got other animals to take care of the glass and take care of the rock. But then they're also moving the sand at the same time because they've got this conical shaped shell and this little wing kind of acts as a plow and they push through that top layer of sand. Aerating the sand or substrate and keeping the surface clean is very, very beneficial because a lot of times the algae will actually grow on the surface. And we have to expect that if you have a healthy tank, corals live in the same exact environment as algae. If you have healthy corals, you're gonna for sure have algae. So that's why this video for me is so important because all of the things that we do lead to promote that, that balanced ecosystem. And because they both live in the same environment, we have to have something outweigh the negative. So by having the right amount of inverts, the right type of inverts, you can live without algae and then not have to worry about dealing with that mess all the time. Uh, peppermint shrimp, probably my second or third favorite invert here out of this whole entire bin. They eat Aptasia, which is a massive benefit. They eat everything opportunistically, including your snails, don't get me wrong. But if you throw food in the aquarium, they come out of the rocks and they pick all through the sand bed. That means that there's nothing left to break down and decompose, adding to your nitrate problems. And while, like I said, they do eat Aptasia, there's that chance that they may go after your corals. If that's the case, then you're probably not feeding enough of a rounded diet in order to keep them happy. Top notch in my book. They're cool for ornamental. Um, they look nice, but they also serve a purpose. Whereas its counterpart, which you see they're kind of going at it here in the aquarium, or I'm sorry, in the, in the bin, the cleaner shrimp, they're good for picking off dead skin cells, sometimes fluke um, parasites off of your fish. They're good for cleaning off dead skin cells on your fish, give them a little more comfort after an, uh, an event, like maybe a crypt outbreak or something like that, which they're not gonna fix, but they do benefit the fish. It makes them feel better to get that, those cysts cleaned up off of their skin. If you've got new fish that are coming out of a quarantine or going into a quarantine without medication, you can utilize them to eradicate the big flukes off of the fish. If you don't quarantine your fish, at least having them in an isolated system with cleaner shrimp is better than not doing anything at all. These are bumblebee snails. These have been kind of revered over the years for taking care of verminid snails. Look, it works. It takes a lot of them. So that's one thing, you, you know, for those skeptics out there that say, oh, I tried it and it doesn't work. I will say that they probably do work. Maybe you have something in there that's eating these snails faster than they're eating the verminid snails, but it will take care of a verminid problem. 
These are a, a big Neceria snail out of Tonga. Awesome, just like the tiger conch for stirring up the top layer of sand. Um, also eating the wasted food and all that, you know, other detritus that ends up in your sand bed. I don't know what's more of a benefit, that surface aeration or the fact that they're detritivore, but these guys, Neceria snails. And then here's another different type of Neceria. And then there's one more called a Vibex, which is the really, really tiny ones. All of which are good for moving the sand around and cleaning up the, that excess waste in your aquarium. This is an anemone crab. Uh, if you've got a carpet anemone, these guys are awesome. And you like that symbiotic relationship, you can watch them move up onto the oral disc, underneath by the foot, but they live. You'll always see them in the anemone, which anybody who's into that whole symbiosis concept, you know, a clownfish and anemone, you can put these guys with them. This. It's called a red serpent star. These are these are most commonly found certain times of year during the summer and in the, the early spring months. Really active when you feed. Otherwise, it's hard to find them. They don't show up good under blue light. So if you like a white light aquarium, these guys look really nice. Um, but they're good for cleaning up detritus, just like an Asarius or just like a blue leg. They're not gonna live on the rocks and they're not gonna eat your algae. And then in this container, last but not least, this is a, a Caribbean sand cucumber. They're primarily nocturnal. Um, when, when you touch them, they scrunch up like that. This guy is probably about, I don't know, four and a half inches long when he's fully extended, but they'll hide in the rocks during the day and then they'll come out at night and you'll see little castings, little, like tubular shaped sand poops, which is like perfectly clean sand. After they're done, it goes in one end and out the other, and nonstop throughout the night, they're cleaning your aquarium. It's another option if you guys are looking to keep a diverse set of inverts. We're on to our last three demos here. We there's a lot more inverts you can put in your aquarium, but these are the these are just a a real gist of the most common ones. This right here, super small. I don't know if you can see them. This is a this is what they call a sexy shrimp. And they're really, really tiny. They don't ever get much bigger than that. Maybe the biggest one I've seen is like an inch and a quarter long. And that was even a monster. These guys are cool. They don't serve any main purpose. They're primarily ornamental. And if you have rock flower anemones, if you have carpet anemones, mini carpets, or even some of your Rhodactus or Discosoma mushrooms. They will live on them and never move. And you can put six or 10 of them and they'll all live on the same mushroom or anemone. It's actually pretty cool how they colonize in such a small space. Again, another one of those natural uh, symbiosis. They're very active eaters, but they're not active as in all over the aquarium. They'll stay in that one remote spot. This here is a Harlequin shrimp. And these are cool, they can be kept in pairs, a male and female together. And I don't know if you can see, but we actually threw an Asterina starfish in here for him. Let me get it away from him. So this, this is a nuisance starfish. And they come in, it can just be one little piece of tubular foot, and these will multiply to be an epidemic in your aquarium. They'll take any starfish, except for the serpent and the brittle stars, and they'll, they'll grab them and flip them upside down. And this little teeny shrimp, this big, can flip over a starfish, you know, three and four inches in diameter just to eat them from the bottom side. So really good at taking care of these nuisance stars. They're called Asterinas. Trust me if you see them, they're not good. You wanna get them out of your aquarium, but it's very common and it's easy to fix by just having a Harlequin. You know, and, and one of the main concerns is what happens when they eat them all? They starve to death. The, the other side of the coin is you can get chocolate chip stars, which are very commonly used for the purpose of feeding Harlequins. And it sounds crude and it sounds terrible, but you can cut off a leg of the chocolate chip starfish, throw it inside of your filtration and leave it back there to feed your harlequin shrimp. And I know some may not like that, but it's again, the ugly truth. The same thing about any kind of invert. You have to have the inverts. They're gonna die. You have to replace them. It's the ugly truth. If it bothers 
certain people that you have to buy something because it's gonna die and you have to buy something to feed another animal. This is probably not the hobby for you, but you know, the way that I look at it is, I'm gonna give them the best chance of survival and I care about the animal. So while they're in my care, they're gonna get the best possible care that they can get. I'm sure you all have heard plenty enough from me for the day. So we can probably wrap this up by saying, inverts, you'll always need to buy them. There's different types. There's algae eaters, there's detritivores, and then there's ornamental inverts. They play all, well, most of them play a crucial role in our, in our aquarium keeping. And just remember, you're always gonna grow algae. As long as you have corals, you're gonna always grow algae. So the best thing you can do is have the right arsenal to keep you from putting in all the manual work. So these guys here, these are the key to our success and I definitely wouldn't do it without the majority of them. And I definitely wouldn't get such gratification out of having a beautiful aquarium if I didn't have inverts like this in there. Again, thanks always for your support. Make sure you come back to our channel. Make sure you hit the like and definitely subscribe because we've got a lot of cool videos coming up in the near future, especially because this 4,000 gallon aquarium is about to be full tilt.